that said, let's begin reading here in Mark chapter 11. I'll begin reading at verse 1, read to verse 11, and we'll be looking at uh, a portion of Scripture speaking of Jesus entering Jerusalem. Mark chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing, loosing the colt? They spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Many spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, for those of you who may not be members of this fellowship, perhaps this may be the first time you've ever sat in and listened to a study that I give. I, I like to begin by reminding those who are, who are with us and listening for the first time that I like to lay a, a foundation in order for those who perhaps haven't been with us, for them to be able to see what's taking place in the order of events and all. And that's what I'll do right now. I'll share a few things with you, remind you of a few things, and then get into the study and go to the heart of it. So recently, as we begin, two of his men had made a request of him, James and John. They had, through their mother, asked for places of honor in his kingdom. And when they had made that request, Jesus said that they didn't know what they were asking for. You see, the cost for such positions was very high. And he was asking, can you actually pay that kind of price? Oblivious to what such a request truly really required, they said, well, yes, we can. We can do this. Well, to this, Jesus answered that the places they desired were not his to give. He, he said his father would determine their places in the kingdom. And he went on to once again inform them of his purpose in coming to planet Earth. He made it clear that he was about to lay down his life as an offering on behalf of all mankind. We saw in chapter 10, verse 45, how he had said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, this is what had been prophesied of Messiah seven centuries earlier. Isaiah the prophet said Messiah would lay down his life for the sin of the world. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, it speaks of, of Messiah. It says, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. In verse 10 of Isaiah 53, he went on to say, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Well, this is the task that he is now on his way to accomplish. He had just been in the city of Jericho. He was now leaving the city, and he's traveling 15 miles to Jerusalem. While he was there in Jericho, Jesus had healed two men of blindness, and the result was that the, the two men immediately began to follow him. And the people who witnessed the miracle when they saw it gave praise to God. Luke 19 tells us that the healing of the blind man was not all that Jesus did in Jericho. He told us that he also ministered to a small man by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. He was very rich, very hated, and very short. Yeah, I, anyway. He also saw the crowd, and he climbed up a sycamore, a fig mulberry tree, to see Jesus. And, and the Bible tells us that Jesus saw him and said he was going to stay with him and was welcomed into the home 
of Zacchaeus. Well, that got many people angry at Jesus Christ. You see, a moment before they were glorifying God and the people were giving praise to God. But now when Jesus shows compassion and love to someone that they hate, they turn on him. That's very common, by the way, is a minister. I've had that happen more than once when I don't do what somebody thinks I'm supposed to do on their behalf because they don't like somebody. They are very quick to criticize and and turn on you. Well, in Luke chapter 19, verse seven, it says when they saw it, they all complained. That word complain means to murmur greatly, saying he's gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. Well, the complaint didn't come just from the Pharisees. That complaint came from the entire crowd. This man had gotten rich off the backs of his own people. He was deeply hated. But upon spending time with Jesus, Zacchaeus yielded up a great amount of his riches. This is what he said. He said, I I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've cheated any, I restore fourfold. Well, what the rich young ruler was unwilling to do, Zacchaeus showed himself willing to do. And in Luke 19, verses 9 and 10, Jesus said to him, Today salvation is coming to this house. Because he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to seek and he came to save the lost. And he's on his way to Jerusalem to do just that. Now, this is the final week of his life. This is the final week of his public ministry. This is going to be his last trip into the city of Jerusalem. This is where he will lay down his life. In Luke 13, 33, Jesus said, it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. So Jesus is now on his way to complete the task that he had been sent on. In Hebrews 10, 7, it says, then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Well, his men are about to see how far loving obedience is really willing to go. Now, this event that we're looking at, this entrance into Jerusalem, is recorded in all four of the Gospels. It's found here in Mark 11, but it's also found in Matthew 21, Luke 19, and the Gospel of John chapter 12. It occurs, as mentioned, in, during his last week, and it is his last major public appearance before he died. So with that said, let's look at the passage in front of us, beginning with verse 1. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village opposite you. And as soon as you have entered it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. Now, Bethphage is is actually literally house of figs. It was a small village opposite of the city called or village called Bethany. Bethany means house of dates. And according to to John chapter 11, verse eight, Bethany was located two miles outside of Jerusalem. We've been through this area many times. You actually go into this area when you're about to descend uh, to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And so we've been here many times and we've seen the general area that this would have taken place. Now, there's going to be, at this time, a lot of excitement in the crowd. There are pilgrims who've accompanied Jesus from the city of Jericho. They had seen the healing of the blind men. They would have had an enormous high after seeing such a thing. When Jesus was near Bethany, many from that village would have also been excited because Jesus had recently raised a man by the name of Lazarus from the dead right there in the city of Bethany. There would have been a great enthusiasm amongst the people. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem and they're entering with him. And so this is an excited crowd of people who are moving and following after Jesus Christ. They're in an area called the Mount of Olives. They're just east of the city. He's there now descending into the city and he's by the small villages again of Bethphage and Bethany. Now, Jesus stayed in Bethany at the house of a man named Simon the leper, according to Matthew 26, verse 6. And it was at that time that he was given a dinner in his honor. And that's when Mary had anointed him. Well, this is the next day. It's Sunday. And he has sent his disciples out on an errand. Notice that verses two and three, he tells them to go into the village opposite you. As soon as you've entered it, you'll find a colt tied 
on which no one has ever sat, loose it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord is need of it. Immediately he will send it here. And so he gives him a, 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 gives him a, a small uh, order, if you will. He says, go into this village. Now, Matthew 22, verse 2 adds a detail. You're going to find a, a, a donkey tied and a colt with her. Uh, up until this, this point, Jesus had discouraged public honor. Uh, we know that in Mark 1, it records how Jesus spoke to a leper uh, that he had cleansed. And he said, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Say nothing to anyone, he had said. In Matthew 16, 20, Matthew tells us that after Peter declared Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God, that Jesus warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he's the Christ. So he has been saying, I don't want this to be spoken of. Keep this to yourself. You see, at this time, Jesus was a marked man. He had healed a paralytic on Shabbat on the Sabbath. And the Jewish authorities were determined to kill him. And that was common knowledge. That's not something they were, they were deluded about or imagining. According to John 7, verse 1, it says, After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee to the north, for he did not want to walk in Judea, which is in the south, because the Jews sought to kill him. Well, in spite of this danger, Jesus is about to once again enter the city of Jerusalem. But before he does so, he gives two of his disciples an order. Notice verse 2. You'll find a cold tide on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. Well, he sends him on this errand because his enemies are plotting to take him prisoner. Again, in John eleven fifty seven, 57, both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that they might seize him. Well, Jesus is aware of the danger. He has no fear concerning it. In Luke 12, verse 50, he said, I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed. I have a baptism to undergo and I'm under great pressure to complete it. Somebody said it was not that he wanted the influencing of the heart of Judas to betray him, the heart of Pilate to condemn him, or the hearts of the wicked Jewish leaders to accuse, condemn, and crucify him. He desired these events for the manifestation of the glory of his father and the redemption of the world by him. So his calm in the face of danger should have inspired his followers. That's what happens. When you keep calm in the face of danger, it inspires people to confidence and calmness too. I've shared this in the past, but we were on a plane. We were flying home from Israel. And as we're approaching the East Coast, we're up there to the Northeast. We're entering into the city or the state of New York. Well, we hit some real rough conditions. It, it, they were so rough that people in the plane were beginning to, to cry out. You could hear people raising their voices in fear, crying. I, I turned and looked behind me, and my, my daughter, Corinne, who was about 15 at the time, and her friend Amy were right behind us, and they were holding hands, and they were singing praise songs. And for me, I thought, well, if it takes this to get you to sing to Jesus, I'm cool with it. But they were really panicking. You know, I'm trying to encourage you to go to Israel. This is what you can see. But anyway, as I think about it. But that happened. And as it's happening, it, there, there, if you ever go to Israel, you, you'll know that there are, there are times that there are certain groups that, of Jewish people who are believers, Orthodox especially, who really don't want much to do with you at all because you are, you are what they call goy. You're goyim. You're of the nations. You're... You're pagans in their sight. So they really, they really don't have much in, uh, to connect with you about. They really don't want you singing with them when they sing and things like that. You'll notice that when you go. That's just the way they are. They don't want that kind of interaction with you. But here we are on the plane, and they're coming up to people. So our people are saying, come into the back and pray with us. That's how scared they were. And so people, our people, many are going into the back of the plane, and they're praying. And, and, all, and all of this is take place, and the masks begin to fall from the ceiling for oxygen. I mean, it was pretty serious. But as I was there, I picked up a magazine, and I was reading it, kind of calmly just reading. And as I did so, you, we went through. I prayed, you know, Lord, whatever, you know, it's up to you. So I might as well read this. And so I was doing that. Well, anyway, we landed, and everything obviously is safe. Here I am, and we made it. 
But my daughter, Corinne, who was 15 at the time, says to me, Dad, I have to ask you a question. I said, what? Why weren't you afraid? I said, baby, I said, because I know that the Lord isn't through with our church. God isn't through with our church. And I know that. She said, did it never occur to you that he doesn't need you to finish what he wants to do in our church? And I said, well, I, no, not at the moment. I'm glad I didn't think it <laughs> when it was on the plane. Just a couple of years ago, my daughter, Anna, who was also on the flight with us, said to me, Dad, do you remember? And I said, yes. She said, I wasn't afraid either. I said, really, baby? She said, no, Daddy, I wasn't afraid either. She says, you know why? And I said, why is that? She said, I was watching you. She said, as I watched you, I knew that if you got afraid, there's a reason for me to be afraid. But when I saw that you were calm, she said, that helped to keep my heart calm. See, leaders are intended to bring calmness into people's lives. They're not intended to stir them up to anger and frustration or fear. Leaders are intended to bring a calmness to hearts. And Jesus entering into the city of Jerusalem in the way he was doing it should have brought confidence to the heart of those who were with him as he was about to enter in. And, and this is what's taking place. And so he gives this very simple order. Notice verse 2 again. He said, go into the village opposite you. As soon as you have entered it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one is at. Loose it and bring it to me. Very simple order. Not too difficult to obey. You see, obedience to the simple commands reveals a movement towards maturity in the Lord. It's the small things that the Lord wants us to be obedient in. Because like it says in Luke 16, verse 10, the one who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in what is much. If you can be trusted in the small things, you will be trustworthy in the greater ones. And so go, you have a simple command. Go and do this is what Jesus is saying to them. And then he says, look, if anyone, verse 3, says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he'll send it here. So, somebody asked the questions, question, was this prearranged? And, uh, and there are those who believe, yes, that it was a prearranged kind of thing because of Jesus entering in, wanting not to attract things, uh, attention to himself. It could have very well been prearranged and all, and he had made comments, and this is your way to get this uh, this done. Uh, it, it, I believe that in doing so, it would have safeguarded his men. The owner of the animals would have been his disciple, and he would have immediately released to them these beasts. So he says, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. Now, I want to talk to you for just a moment about that. That's a, an interesting phrase. Why are you doing this? And they do ask him that. They say, why are you doing this? Why are you unloosing these animals? All you need to do is to tell him this. The Lord has need of it. When he speaks of the Lord, the Lord is a way of speaking of the one who owns all things. The proprietor of all things has need of it. He has need of the donkey and the colt. Now that, that phrase, the Lord has need of it, is interesting the word need in the original language speaks of necessity, duty, or business. It's humbling when we realize that God actually needed something from us. You see, God uses what we offer him to perform his amazing works. In order for his work to be done, there are those who give him aid in order that it might be performed. By saying the Lord has need of it, we get the idea that the man is one of Jesus' followers. And that would have been done quickly because the man is one of his disciples. Now, again, notice how Mark says the Lord has need of it. In Scripture, we see many examples of the Lord needing something. For example, the Lord needed water pots so he could turn water into wine for wedding guests. The Lord needed a boat so he could preach. And he asked Peter for the use of his boat. And he turned Peter's boat into a pulpit. The Lord needed a drink of water. So he asked the Samaritan woman for a drink. The Lord needed fish and bread. So he could miraculously feed multitudes. The Lord needed a garden called Gethsemane. So he could rest and he could pray. 
The Lord needed a tomb to be buried in, and it was provided for him by Joseph. And so there are things that the Lord makes use of that we offer to him, things that he needs. It says that he'll send it back. Immediately, he'll send it back. This is saying that, that Jesus will use it, but will return it after using it in the same way that he only needed to use the tomb that was lent to him for a very short time. Now, why did he need the colt? In order to fulfill a prophecy that was made in 520 before Christ by a prophet named Zechariah. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So in his entrance to Jerusalem, he's fulfilling this prophecy 520 plus years before. Now, I want to develop this with you. We need to remember that Jesus' life and ministry fulfilled God's word. Jesus came to fulfill the Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah and his first coming. In Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. When Zechariah is told, tell the daughter of Zion, well, Zion is another way of speaking of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is called Zion in Scripture. Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So this is a prophecy that relates to Zion or Jerusalem. And so they go there to fulfill that prophecy. Now, it says in verse 4, they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. So they found that colt tied outside of a door by the street. They unloosed it. They were asked that question, why are you loosing the colt? They gave the answer Jesus supplied. Upon hearing the response, the men let them take him. He rode on a donkey. Now, why did he do that? He rode on a donkey because it represented his humble and gentle rule. See, it was a symbol at that time of peace and nobility. In the book of Judges, in the Old Testament, chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, it says, My heart is with the princes of Israel, with the volunteers among the people. Bless the Lord. You who ride white donkeys, who sit on saddle blankets, and you who also travel the road. So this was a, a symbol of peace and nobility. So when a king would arrive on a donkey, it was a, a time of, of peace. But when a king rode on a, a horse, well, we need to remember that horses were used for war. During the reign of Solomon, horses from Egypt were imported so all Solomon could use it for warfare. And a king coming in war would normally do so on a horse. That's why Revelation 19.11 says, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse. He who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. You see, Jesus at this time is bringing peace, and he's doing so with humility. The colt that he rode on was unbroken. It had never been ridden. That helps us to understand that it was reserved for sacred use. It, it was demonstrating something of Christ. It was demonstrating his lordship over all creation. You see, an unbroken animal isn't going to yield, but this one did. It was reserved for sacred use, and so Jesus sat on it, and that's why that little animal received him. And when you read your Bible, you'll notice certain things. It's interesting how an unbroken animal yielded to the Lord without resistance, but you also see that demons did, and fevers did, and blindness did, leprosy did, para paralysis did, even death itself yielded to Jesus' command. Nature yielded to his commands. In Matthew 8, 27, it tells us that even the winds and the sea obey him. So demons and illness and nature yields to him, but men refuse to. One other thing that we can learn from this story is this. If God can use even the most humble and lowly creature for his great glory, how might he use you if you're willing? Imagine that. What could God do with a willing vessel? In a sense, it would be almost like him saying, I have need of you. 
You see, we, we worship the invisible God. And how are people on the face of the earth going to recognize the reality of his rule if they don't see the reality of his rule in his subjects? And so when, he's, when people see us living for God and living lives that are obvious, tangible, they're visible, and there are reasons that we live in such a way, people will have an understanding that there is a God in heaven who does, Lord, over the lives, and, and these people are his subjects. And so in many ways, the Lord uses us even to this day. There was a very famous statue in a small village in, in the nation of Paris after World War II. It was seen that there was a statue of Jesus that they had put in, in a courtyard there in the square. But the, the hands of the statue were missing because when, when uh, the city had been bombed, there was damage done to everything around, and the damage actually removed the hands of this, this uh, statue that was portraying Jesus. And, and so people approached the villagers after uh, it had never been repaired and asked the question, why have you never replaced the hands of Jesus? And the townspeople said, because we have come to realize that in many ways we are his hands, and so we live as his hands. And that's a good way to think about it, that, that the Lord will use you in many ways as his hands. He can use you as his mouth as you speak. He can has, use you as his feet as you go for him to preach the gospel. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is, is, is giving to them this understanding, and, and uh, that's how it's going to work in the future. Well, it says they, they brought the colt to Jesus, verse 7, and threw their clothes on it and he sat on it, Many spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So what they do is they basically bring it back to him, the colt, and they make a cushion for him to sit so he's not uncomfortable. And as this is taking place, verse 8 tells us that many spread their clothes on the road, others cut down leafy branches. So they spread their outer garments as a sign of honor and submission. They place very small branches and twigs before him to form a carpet. And notice it says, and, and those who went before and those followed cried out, saying, Hosanna. So when you combine the different accounts, uh, you can see that there are actually two crowds that are converging. You have a crowd coming from Jerusalem to meet them as others are descending from the Mount of Olives. In, in John 12, verses 12 and 13, it says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they, they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. Luke 19, 37 says, he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. So the crowd is excited. And their excitement, I want to develop this with you, seems to be really localized on his mighty works. Now recently, Jesus had healed the two blind men. And many had been there when he had done so. And then Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. And that had caused many to believe in him. He had been in a tomb for four days. And during that day, there was a tradition of belief that, that you would know he was certainly dead by the fourth day. And that's why when Jesus said, remove the stone there at the, at the grave of Lazarus, that's why they said it has been four days. By now, he, the rot has taken place. He, he's de decaying. He stinks. And Jesus wanted to make sure that they knew for an absolute fact that he was dead before he raised him to life. And so when he did so, the crowd that was there watching this, it just blew their minds. I mean, of course it would if something like that took place. And, and they're just enthusiastic. So you have a crowd from Jericho. And this crowd from Jericho had seen Jesus healing the blind men, and then you have those in Bethany who knew that Lazarus was an inhabitant of that village, a well-known one, a wealthy one on top of that, 
And they, they knew that he had raised this man from the dead. So the combination of the two, those, those miracles had gotten their attention. And, and now they're saying, save now. The word Hosanna means save now. And they're calling him Messiah. And so this large crowd is, is, is actually exuberant about this. In John 12, verses 9 through 11, it says, A large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there in Bethany and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For, an, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So at this point, I'm going to spend a few moments with you considering what is taking place. There are people who are excited at Jesus' entrance, and they're especially caught up with his miracles. Healing the blind man, men and raising Lazarus impacted them. And miracles do that kind of thing. And this is part of the reason that Jesus performed miracles. It, the miracle would draw attention. Miracles, signs, and wonders. A miracle is something supernatural that only God himself can do. Wonder is the response to it. You have wonder and awe. Signs point you somewhere. And so when you read the scriptures, miracles, signs, and wonders, that gives you insight into what that means. The miracles were, 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 were things that only God himself could do. Only God could raise the dead. And, and wonder, the people would be amazed at that. And the sign was a point to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus never did miracles just for attention. Jesus did miracles to draw people to have faith in him. That's why he performed these miracles. It, it, it gave them a, a possibility of giving him his, their attention. And that gave to Jesus the opportunity to preach the message. Now, in the Gospel of John 5, 31 through 39, Jesus gave various testimonies of who he is. He spoke of John the Baptist's testimony. He spoke of the Father's testimony of him. And he th then he gave another testimony of who he was. It's found in John 5, 38 and 39, where Jesus said, You do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. He went on to say, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me as amazing and wonderful as the signs and wonders were they could not save people miracles were intended to reveal god's presence with them to draw their attention but what saved them would be believing the message that was found in scripture that's why jesus would do a miracle demonstrating the kingdom of god is present amongst them when he'd heal the sick, it's because there are no, no sick in heaven. When he raised the dead, there are no dead in heaven. When he healed the blind, there are no blind in heaven. When he touched the ears of the deaf, there are no deaf in heaven. You know, there are no lepers in heaven. There are no paralyzed people in heaven. So he did that to show that the kingdom of God is present in him to draw their attention. And then when he would do it, and they would come with this, this wonder and this awe. He would tell them what life is. He would tell them how to have life. And so that's what the gospel's intended to do. Before I got saved, I was a typical kid in many ways. One of the things as an unbeliever, that I actually did believe is this, and I want to develop this with you because I'm going to show you something here in Scripture in just a moment. But, I, you know, today we have people say, well, I can't believe that. How can I believe the Bible? The Bible's just written by some men, you know. What this, why do you believe it? Well, here, here's, here was my reasoning first as a non-believer, and then I'll give you something else. As a non-believer, I thought, now, wait a minute. If there's such a thing as God, and I believe that there was, if there's such a thing as God, then God cannot be limited because it just makes sense to me that if there's one called God, he would have to be all powerful. He'd have to be all knowing. He'd even have to be all present. He'd have to be above his creation, beyond his creation. 
in such a way that creation itself couldn't reach him. So God would have to reach creation. Why? Because his ways, I find out later in reading scripture, are, his ways are past finding out. He has to reveal himself. But as a, a non-believer, I said, if there's a God, this God could do whatever this God wants to do. What's an amazing thing about this God is that the God that we serve isn't the God that I would have thought would have been in existence. Why? Because we live in a system where the mightier have a tendency of hurting the lesser. The stronger have a way of dominating the weaker. And yet the scripture is the opposite. This great God who created all things loves the weaker ones. And actually, Jesus served, washed their feet. Didn't make any sense. But if we have a God, and if there's such a thing as God, I thought as a 20-year-old, then why wouldn't it be possible for this God to communicate? Why wouldn't he? And I already knew that idols didn't. Well, it's like what the psalmist said. I found later reading scripture. The psalmist said, eyes they have, they cannot see. Ears they have, they cannot hear. Mouths they have. They cannot speak, noses they have, they cannot smile, hands they have, they cannot reach out, legs they have, feet they have, they cannot walk, and those who make them are like them. They're dead wooden idols with no life in them, and those who worship them are dead inside also. That's what the Bible says, and it's true. So I had people saying, how can you believe the Bible? Well, I'm thinking, well, why can't you? What kind of God do you worship that can't communicate? What kind of God do you worship that can't make his will known? What kind of God is that? That's not a God. That's a man. That's a person. But the God that we serve makes his ways known to us. That made sense. So I was, you know, I, a lot of people believe in miracles. I believe that there were weird things that were going on. You can't explain. I believe that as a non-believer. Things that you just kind of put into the category of, wow, that's weird. But nothing beyond that. And then I got saved. And when I got saved, I got saved because of the preaching of the gospel. A message that unveiled my heart. Like the woman at the well who said, come and hear a man who told me all things I've ever done. Can this be Messiah? Because when the word of God is taught and God's Holy Spirit is working, sometimes it unveils our heart before our own eyes. And we see ourselves. We might even get mad. We might even reject it. How dare you? Oh, you're so judgmental. Why? Because your heart is being revealed. That's what happens. God is opening up your heart. The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's like a surgeon's scalpel dividing asunder soul and spirit so that he can reveal what's inside of it. That's what the word of God does. See, that's how it works. And so one of the things that we as Christians need to remember is we have something no other quote unquote religious philosophy has on the face of the earth. We have prophecy. Why? Because we have a God who can tell you the end from the beginning. We have a God who prophesies, who tells us what's going to take place. And Jesus Christ in his life, he literally fulfilled no less than 300 specific prophecies concerning Messiah. Conservatively. His manner of birth, his place of birth, his lineage, his entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey, his betrayal, his manner of death, the place of burial, they weren't fulfilled by chance or by coincidence. The scripture gave testimony hundreds of years before the fact. And Jesus uniquely fulfilled these ancient prophecies. This is a professor, Peter W. Stoner. I had a lot of friends who were stoners, but <laughs> Peter W. Stoner. He was a chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Astronomy at Pasadena City College and chairman of the Science Division at Westmont uh, Christian College. And he published a book entitled Science Speaks. And he gave the mathematical probability of one person fulfilling just one, rather just eight of the clearest messianic prophecies. The mathematical probability of one person fulfilling just eight of the clearest messianic prophecies. And he found that the chance of one man fulfilling just eight of the prophecies was one in 10 to the 17th power. Uh, I don't know what that means. So, so I, I looked it up. Okay, what comes after a million? A billion. What comes after a billion? A trillion. I'm lost. But what comes, what comes after a trillion? And I looked. A quadrillion. 
Okay, I just used the word I don't get. But this is what he did. He said, Peter Stoner pointed this out. He said, cover the entire state of Texas. Think for a moment. That is the largest state outside of Alaska that we have. Some of you have driven through it and it takes hours. Some of you have flown over it. It takes hours. It's huge, right? A huge, it just sounded like Trump. It's huge, really huge. It's a huge state. But anyway. Stoner. But anyway. <laughs> cover the entire state of Texas with silver dollars to a level. Oh, to a level of two feet. The entire state. Try to imagine. I can't imagine. But try. The entire, the entire state to a level of two feet. Silver dollars. Take one silver dollar and mark it with an X. Fly over the state. Throw it in the air. It lands. Somebody goes and shuffles all the coins and buries it two feet. Blindfold somebody. Send them out across the border in Texas and tell him, find the marked silver dollar. The chances of him finding or her finding that marked silver dollar is the same chances that Jesus would have fulfilled just eight of those prophecies. That's what that says. Jesus fulfilled over 300. We have a God who tells us what's going to happen before it does. And that's the God that we worship. So, yeah, you can do that. I, I heard one hand. This, <laughs> the sound of one hand clapping, I heard it. These people are not crying out for salvation. The word Hosanna, saved now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David. They're not crying out for salvation. They're crying out for salvation from Roman rule. They're not asking for the Messiah. They're asking for deliverance because they hated the oppressive Roman government. How do we know that? Well, many of those voices that are crying out, save now, are going to be saying in a week, crucify him. They were not crying out for salvation. They're crying out to be pulled out of the circumstances they're in. And there are a lot of people like that. I've known them in the past and all, I need God, I need God, help me, God, help me, God, I need God, I believe in you, God, I'll do whatever you say, God, help me, I, I don't want to go to jail, help me, God, I don't want to go through this, help me, God. And then if they get delivered, yeah, they go right back to what they were doing, right back to it, like the dog returning to the vomit. Why is that? Because they weren't sincere, and that's what's going on here. You know, it's a festive time, it's a, it's a parade, we're part of it. You know, these two blind men had been healed of blindness. This dead man is, is alive. Oh, save now. Deliver us from Roman oppression. Well, Luke records something, gives us insight, and I'll close with this. In Luke 19, verses 41 through 44, it says, As he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, close you in on every side, level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. When Jesus is there and he's looking down at the city he's about to descend and enter into, he stops and Luke tells us and he wept. One of the things about the Lord Jesus Christ that, that I've gotten into my heart is the knowledge that he was able to weep over a friend, Lazarus, when he was at Lazarus's grave. The easiest verse in Scripture is two words, Jesus wept. And then Luke tells us here in chapter 19, he says, he wept over a city. If you want to be used by the Lord, you need to learn to weep not only for your nation and not only for your city, but you need to learn to weep for an individual too. That's where real change begins to take place. And that's what's happening. 
Jesus is looking at the city and he says, if you'd have known, if only you'd have known. This is your day. He says, but you didn't know. Notice the time of your visitation. That word visitation is a Greek word that speaks of an investigation. It, it speaks of a, a close inspection. The definition of this word is, it is the act by which God looks into and searches out the ways, deeds, and character of men in order to judge them properly. Now, wait a minute. How could they have known the time of their visitation? Is it just because he had been there for those three years and all? Is that what he's speaking of? Well, Sir Robert Anderson wrote The Coming Prince. Another brother by the name of Harold Honer wrote the chronological aspects of the life of Christ. And they give us insight into, into this when they, have re, when they were researching the book of Daniel. When you read Daniel 9, 24 through 27, Daniel has what's called Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. And it says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. You add those together, those are 69 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. After the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The, the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war of desolation, uh, until the end war des uh, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall there be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Okay, I'll close with this. Daniel prophesied that 70 weeks were determined to accomplish specific things. One was to finish the transgression. To finish the transgression speaks of ending Jewish apostasy for the, for the Jewish nation to receive Messiah when he arrives. Also to make an end of sin, to completely deal with it, which is what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Third is to make reconciliation which again was accomplished in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says that, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, committed to us the word of reconciliation. Fourth, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and that occurs when Jesus rules and reigns. Then to seal up vision and prophecy, which are no longer necessary, because everything's been completed, and then to anoint the most holy, Jesus as his reign, in his reign as Messiah. So, Sir Robert Anderson's coming prince points something out that helps us understand. This is what he wrote concerning Daniel's 70 weeks. He treated the 70, the number 70, as weeks of years, because when he looked at the weeks as literal days and weeks, there were 490 days and nothing occurred. So he went to the Jewish method of the uh, Sabbath rest, which would be uh, uh, actually weeks of years. In Leviticus 25, 3 and 4, it says, Six years you shall show, uh, sow your field. Six years you shall prune your vineyard, gather its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a, a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. So what he did is he went with uh, weeks of years. The command to restore and build Jerusalem is found in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, verse 5. It came through a, a king named Artaxerxes, and the date is in history, March 14th, 445 B.C. So the prophecy speaks of 69 weeks of years. Anderson took 69, multiplied it by 7, representing the days of the week. He then multiplied it by 360, days of the Jewish calendar and included what we call leap years. He ended up with 173,880 days and he began counting back from this date, March 14th, and he arrived at, after counting 173,880 days, he arrived at April 6th, AD 32, which is also known 
as Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. And that's why Jesus said, if you'd have known this day, your day. They missed the day of visitation. And that's why Jesus weeps over the city. They didn't know as he entered into the city, what we call Palm Sunday, they didn't know that was their surprise investigation. Daniel 9.25 spoke of seven weeks and 62 weeks combined to 69 weeks. And then Daniel 9.26 went on to say, after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. That spoke of Jesus' death on our behalf. They didn't recognize their day of visitation, and Jesus wept because of it. They didn't recognize their Messiah, though they had been prepared to receive him. And the result was the destruction of Jerusalem under Titus of Rome. The 70th week is a week that occurs in what is called the seven-year tribulation. Those 69 weeks were fulfilled when Jesus entered in. In Matthew 21, 10 and 11, it says, when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? The multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. He was not simply a prophet. He was Messiah. But they didn't know that. And what does he do? Verse 11, Jesus went into Jerusalem, into the temple, when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. We'll be picking this up next time. But as he looked around, he saw that they were still doing the sinful things that he had cleansed that temple of three years earlier. But the hour was late. The hour is late in many ways. Father, we ask